And hopefully this will enlighten you somewhat. But more than anything, what I hope is that it will give you an interest in studying this subject more on your own. So that you will come to a better understanding of the nature of the people of God. And I put the nature of the church, but the church really is only one term of about eight terms that are used uh, in the scriptures to talk about the people of God. And uh, when we look at this, the English word church is actually a made up word that was used to translate a Greek word because the translators did not want to offend the ruling authority that, you know, that authorized them or, or supported them in translating the Greek scriptures into the English. And so sometimes they would come up upon these words that the clergy of the day was teaching that this means a certain thing and they did not want to fly in the face of that authority that might even in some cases uh, put their head on a chopping block. And so they would come up with a word that did not mistranslate the Greek term, but didn't really translate it either. And such a word is, bapti is the Greek word baptizo, which was translated with the word baptism. And that was called transliteration. Now, the word church is the Greek ekklesia, and ekklesia that sounds nothing like the word church, the word church probably came from the Scott Kirk and the English Circe. It, that's the best I can figure out, but I'm not certain that that's exactly it. But these words had an institutional feel to them, and the church was viewed in that day as an institution. And so these words were used to translate that word ecclesia, which really simply means the assembly. And we'll talk a little bit more about that term um, as we go down in our study. The first of the eight words that we want to look at, and really there are more than eight words here, but if you trace them back, the other words really are parallel to one or the other of these eight terms that we're going to discuss. And so there are some other terms used in there, but these are the eight ideas that are given to us about the kingdom of heaven or about the people of of God. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Same message that John the Baptist had been preaching for some time. Jesus, when he began to preach, began to preach that message. And so what is this kingdom? In Daniel chapter 2, uh, we have an idea of of what this is, a little bit more of an idea of what this is in prophecy because uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he called upon his wise men to interpret the dream and none of them could do it. Daniel comes in and Daniel says, I, can interpret the, I cannot interpret the dream, but the God whom I serve can interpret your dream. And so he went in then and told him and in verse 44... In verses 45 of Daniel chapter 2 we read, And in the days of these kings this God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now taking that verse out of context, we might think that this kingdom is a worldwide kingdom, and this actually was the Catholic concept of the church. And the Pope for many, many centuries thought that he by divine right should rule the world. And if you take this scripture, as I say, this verse out of context, it kind of sounds like that, doesn't it? It's going to break in pieces all of these other kingdoms. And it's going to consume them. But that's not really the meaning of it. Because as we continue to read, Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands... That's a very important statement. And that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, its interpretation is true. Now Daniel doesn't really explain this beyond that, but it gives us a hint that this kingdom that is going to be established 
which is carved out of this mountain without hands is a spiritual kingdom and not a physical kingdom. And the fact that it's going to break in pieces all of these other kingdoms does not mean that it's going to rule them, but simply it's going to outlast them. And it's going to be an eternal kingdom that will never be destroyed. And so we understand from that, and as we view more uh, passages of Scripture about the kingdom, here again, we, I'm not going to exhaust this idea of kingdom here, because we just simply don't have time. I want to get through all eight of these terms. But get yourself a good concordance. Look down through it and start reading the passages of Scripture in the New Testament that talk about kingdom. And maybe even go back in the Old Testament and start studying the passages that talk about kingdom. Now you're going to read a lot in there about passages that talk about this kingdom or that kingdom. The uh, Arabic kingdoms or the Israelite kingdom or this or that kingdom. But... As you sort through those, you'll begin to get a better feel about what the kingdom of heaven really is. Uh, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 through 19, he says to Peter, after Peter confessed him as Jesus the Christ, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth, it will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, we see here that the kingdom is the same thing as the church, the ecclesia. Now, maybe we ought to dispense with the word church and use the word ecclesia, uh, but we won't. We'll, we'll use the word church. But... Uh, Many people have thought that this kingdom was going to be an earthly kingdom. And premillennials have taught that, well, Jesus came down to establish his kingdom and he failed to do what he came to do. And so he left us with the church. And the kingdom is yet to come. Now, some of our brethren in uh, arguing this with the premillennials have come to the conclusion that every time we read about the kingdom of heaven, it's talking about the church. And the two are equal to each other. I don't think that's true. I believe that there is a sense in which that is true. But there's a sense in which the kingdom is yet to come. Because it talks about the heavenly kingdom. And in Revelation it talks about that kingdom coming down from heaven. And so there's a sense in which the kingdom, yes it's here now. But there's also a sense in which we are yet to receive it. But the kingdom we are yet to receive is not an earthly kingdom. It is a kingdom that transcends the gates of death. When Jesus said to Peter that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, the King James uses the word hell there. Now the Greek word is a different word than the word that is actually translated by what we know as our English word hell. Uh, it's Gehenna is translated in the American standard as hell and the Hadean world is translated as Hades. And Hades, it refers to the grave. Jesus is not saying there that hell will not prevail against it. He's saying that death is not going to stop people, is not going to end the kingdom, is not going to stop people from being in the kingdom. They're still there. As Jesus said, he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and David. And that means they still exist. Jesus said that to the Sadducees, who believed that man ceased to exist when he died. And Jesus said, no, they still exist because God still exists and there is an eternal existence of all mankind. Now, you might say, well, Mark, I don't really understand how we have the kingdom, but we're going to get the kingdom. It's really the same kind of sense in which we might say, I am saved. But then, you know, as I was growing up, I used to hear men pray a lot of times, and I don't hear it so much anymore, but I would hear them pray and finally save us. Well, now, wait a minute. If I'm saved, why do I need to be finally saved? Because even though I might be saved at this moment, I can lose that salvation because I've not finished my race on this earth yet. And so we're praying for God to keep us faithful unto death as Revelation chapter 2 and 10 tells us we must be so that we can be finally saved. And so there is a sense in which we have the kingdom now, 
but a sense in which we will receive the kingdom in eternity. And Revelation talks a little bit more about that. We'll, we'll talk about that as we go through the rest of these verses. We, we will refer to Revelation there. So this is the kingdom. The idea of kingdom refers to an idea of rule and authority and being a citizen. Then it talks about the body of Christ. The people of God as being a body. Now you might say, well, how does that apply? Well, in Romans chapter 12, it talks about the people of God being a body and how that we are all, though severally members, we're all unified as one. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. I put on here only read to 7, but I read to verse 8 there. Because that's the entire context. Well, you know, my index finger has a different function on my hand than my little finger. But you know, if I lost either one of them, I'd have to completely relearn how to write, how to grip a hammer, how to do everything that I do with that hand. I know a lady that uh, when I was in uh, junior high school, she had lost the middle toe on her right foot. And, uh, you know, of course, when I was in junior high school, she was a really old lady. She's really probably about what age I am now. But to me then, she was really old. And somebody asked her one time, said, I guess losing your middle toe was not that big a deal. Uh, it's not like it would throw you off balance. She said, oh, no. She said, I had to completely relearn how to walk. She said, it completely threw my whole body off, my balance and everything. She said, I could hardly even sit up straight for a while until I relearned how to do all these things. Because that middle toe was very integral to how her whole body functioned. And when we lose just one part of our body, you see it affects all the rest of us. For many, many years it was thought that tonsils didn't do anything. And doctors would come through the school system. I know uh, a man who was my parents' age said that the doctor would come through his public school system and he just cut everybody's tonsils out. Just summarily, whether you were having trouble or not. And he said, my parents said, no, you're not going to operate on our child because he's not having trouble. He doesn't need the operation. And now they find out that tonsils actually have something to do with our immune system. And if we lose them too early in life, then our immune system will be weak as we become adults. So you see, even these organs that don't seem to have any function have a very vital function. In this local body, we, uh, we just lost some of our members. And it hurts. James and Melody and little Titus are gone from us. Now they're not lost to the kingdom, to the church universal, but they're gone from this local body of Christians. And their loss is being keenly felt even just today when they've just left. Because now us, us men that are left have got to do each of us a lot more in the public assembly. And you know, sometimes women will come and say, well, what can I do? I'm just a woman. I'm not very important. I can't preach. I can't teach. I can't lead singing. I can't. And, and we focus on the things we cannot do. But let me tell you something. And, and some men, some preachers especially that I have known in my life have looked at women as being second class Christians. Because... <laughs> You know, they, they can't do all of these things that the men can do. There's nobody that's unimportant. Every person here has a function. And whether you can speak publicly, or whether you can help the singing to be better, whether you can 
write cards and letters to the sick. Every bit of that. And I, I can go on and on with the list, but here again we're running out of time. Every bit of that is important. And if you were taken away from this group for whatever reason, you would be missed. Because you have a function. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, reading verses 12 through 31, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. And if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body... If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? For now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? Now we can go on and finish reading for, through verse 31, but we won't. But the point here simply is, everybody has a function. And everybody needs to step up to the plate and perform the thing that God has given you the talent to do. I think very keenly about the words of Mordecai to Queen Esther. Esther was really nobody. She was a little Jewish girl who was just really kidnapped by King Ahasuerus and hauled in and, and then all of a sudden she was made queen. But you know how much authority she had as queen? None. Not one bit. If she walked into that throne room and the king had not summoned her, and he didn't hold out the scepter to her, she would be executed just as surely as any other member of that kingdom. And she stated that to Mordecai. And Mordecai said, if you hold your peace, and I'm paraphrasing this, deliverance for the God's people is going to come from another source, but you and your father's house will be destroyed. And who knows if thou art come to the kingdom at such a time as this. The little thing that she did, saved God's people from destruction. And here was a woman who had no authority whatsoever, but she is memorialized in an entire book of the scriptures. The word church in Greek simply means an assembly. Now it comes from a root word, ekklesia is a, comes from a root meaning called out. And it means to be, but it means to be a part of an assembly, a part of a group. A grouping. Now, when we become a part of a group, that necessitates that we leave off being individuals, come together, and become part of an assembly. We cease to be, to act on an individual level, and we act on an assembly level now. Just as in Acts chapter 19, Demetrius called all the silversmiths together. In that assembly, and guess what? In verses 32 and in verse 39, the exact same Greek word that is consistently translated church everywhere else is translated with the word assembly. Because that's what it means. It is not a word that was used in the first century to refer to God's people. It was a word that was used to refer to any kind of an assembly. And it was a riotous assembly. It was a riotous church, if you will. Now there's another word that's used in two other places in that same passage, the word demas. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it or not. I'm not a Greek scholar. D-E-M-A-S is how Strong says that it's spelled out in English. I'll put it that way. And it means a group as well. And so ekklesia meaning assembly, demas meaning group. And the words are used interchangeably there. This is a word which simply means we come together and we form a collective. The word church is a collective noun of which the individual unit is always an individual person. If we're talking about the people of God when we use the word church, that individual unit is a saint. Doesn't matter whether you're talking about the church universal or the church local. The church universal is not made up of local churches. It's made up of saints. 
The church local is made up of saints. Because that's the only unit that we see throughout the scriptures in that word church. And we need to understand that very clearly. Moving on, we talked about, it talks about God's people as being a family. You know, this is one of the things that's so often missed uh, by people when they think of the church in an institutional sense. And, and when I say institutional sense, I'm talking about a, a corporate sense. Uh, it's an empty box into which God has placed all of the blessings that he has for mankind. And this is according to the Catholic definition. If you read Catholic uh, literature... The Catholic definition of the church is it is a corporate box into which God has placed all of the blessings he has for mankind. And there are seven sacraments that are blessings. Marriage is one, the Lord's Supper is another, salvation is another, and so on we go. And you come to this box and you enter into the box to receive God's blessings. The fact is, God has never presented the church that way in the scriptures. It has always been that I come to God and I receive salvation. And then as Acts 2, chapter 2 and verse 42 says, and he added to them, that's the church, such as were being saved. So I come to God for the blessings he has for me and that makes me a part of the church, part of the family. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 gives us a good idea of this family. But I am delayed. I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. It is, in fact, <clears throat> where did I pick? You know what? That passage was meant for uh, the last point. I'm sorry. Let's move on to uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. And see this idea of family and how it's used in at least one scripture. I threw, kind of threw these slides together in a hurry and I apologize. I messed one up. Um, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those things who do not obey the gospel of God? And in fact, 1 Peter 3.15 was supposed to be in this point because it's talking about the house of God is the church. And here it talks about the house of God and judgment beginning with the house of God. Now that's not talking about a corporate box, as it were. That's talking about the, the people that exist in the church. The church is the people, the family of God. And the idea of family gives us the idea of headship. The father being the head of a family. God is the head of the church. And each one of us are children of God. Meaning we have an inheritance. Now you think about that for a minute. We have an inheritance. A lot of people in this world think they have an inheritance... Jesus was accosted by one man that said, Lord, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. He was talking about physical money. Jesus said, I, I'm not going to do that. Not why I came. He could have made a friend there if he'd done that. But he said, that's not why I came. Because your inheritance is a spiritual inheritance that you can't get on this earth. Look with me, if you will. Ephesians chapter 1, and really the first 18 verses... Uh, talk about this. Let's start with verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to, notice the idea of family here, to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted to the beloved. 
In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth in Him, in whom we also have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints." The idea of belonging to God and having an inheritance with Him. Not an inheritance that we deserve, we might add, but an inheritance that we shall receive through the grace of our Father in heaven. You know, I've often thought, you know, many, many family members, when, when the patriarch dies, they think, oh boy, I'm going to get my share. You don't have a share. I've told my mother and father that when you die, if you want to give every penny you've got to the uh, SPCA or whoever, it's your money, not mine. And I don't care what you do with it, but I want to see that your money goes, your inheritance goes where you want it to go. And if they desire that I get something out of that estate, then I will be grateful for that. I had an uncle, he's my rich uncle, gave every one of us cousins, all of his nieces and nephews, $10,000 each. And I was adding up how much money that was, and it was a staggering sum of money out of his estate. He gave to all of us. He didn't need to do that because it was his money. But by his grace, he gave it to us. And it's by God's grace that we receive an inheritance as family members. Now when the family, when one member of the family is hurting, what happens to the rest of the family? Do they just abandon them? In some families, yes they do, but not normally. The rest of the family will gather around most of the time. I was at a funeral just recently for a young woman that had shot herself. Don't know if it was what, what the circumstances were. Things were being pretty closely kept. Did not know the young lady. Had only met her, had only heard about her recently through someone else. And I thought maybe I could go and offer some comfort to the family and maybe to her husband. Um, but the family was all gathered around up in the front of the funeral home. And they were all there because they were hurting. And they hurt together. Family does that. Family does that. And when one member of the family is rejoicing because of good fortune, the rest of the family, if it's a normal family unit, rejoices with them. When someone does good, family is going to be proud of that. Oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm brother to so and so even though they may not have a part in their good fortune. I'm, I'm still, I'm related to him. Because that's what family does. We're also called the temple. Temple is a dwelling place of deity. Now think about the significance of that for a moment. In the Old Testament, <coughs> they had to go to the temple, or the tabernacle before the temple was built, 
to make their offerings. And, uh, and, and they couldn't just go out just anywhere and, and offer fire to God and, and, and burn the incense or things like that. And you know, Nadab and Abihu tried to do that. And I'm not, I'm not certain that this was the entirety of their sin, but it appears that what they did was they tried to offer... God had just finished giving the instructions for where and how the offerings were to be made, and here they go and take their censers out into the assembly and they offered strange fire before Jehovah, and he consumed them with fire. We're the temple of God. You know, Jesus, when he was speaking to the woman at the well, and I didn't include this passage in here, I should have, and I, I will, um, Jesus said to her, you know, she said, well, where should we worship? You know, our fathers say that we should worship here in Mount, was it Gerizim? I believe it was Gerizim. And the Jews say we need to worship in Jerusalem. Well, where should we worship? And Jesus said, the time is coming and now is when the true worshipers are going to worship God in spirit. That's the place. The place is within us. Because we become the temple. Of God, And we are talked about as being building blocks and so on and so forth. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Read verses 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Wow. The Jews had to travel to get to the temple. But we are the temple of God wherever we meet. We don't have to make a yearly pilgrimage back to Jerusalem to worship God acceptably. We can worship God wherever we are and wherever we get together. And Jesus said, for where two of you or three of you are gathered together, there am I in the midst of you. In first epistle of Peter, first letter of Peter, chapter 2. Reading verses 4 through 8. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Where are the temple? That is just a fantastic concept. The Jews couldn't even conceive of that. But we have it. We're also called the priesthood of God. Now, that may not be something that we totally understand. But certain sacrifices only a priest could offer. And in Hebrews it talks about the high priest having to offer a sacrifice for himself first to atone for his own sins, then he could go into the Holy of Holies and begin making his sacrifice to God for the people. But if the people needed to make a sacrifice, they couldn't just do it wherever. They had to go to the priest. And you know, Eli's sons, as we remember from our study in 1 Samuel, took advantage of that and took advantage, great advantage of the people. Because they were required to bring their offerings and sacrifices to them. And so they extorted from the people and they misused their office. We don't have that problem. Because we have direct access to God Almighty. We don't have to go to a priest. When Wayne and I were in in India, uh, we heard these bells in Nalgonda. Ding, 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 ding. Early in the morning, a lot earlier than we wanted to. And finally we realized what it was. It was some shamans or some priests. And they were, I, I think I showed you a picture of a couple of them here. 
and they were all dressed in grass and everything and uh, they were asking for money for the people so that they could receive their blessing for the year. And if the people gave them money, they gave them a little book so they could write their name and address in that book and how much money they gave so the priest would know how much blessing to bestow upon them for the year. We go direct to the Father who is above all to receive our blessings. We don't go through some other man. The Jews couldn't do that. Even under the patriarchal dispensation, they couldn't do that. They had to go to the patriarchs. Abraham went to Melchizedek and gave him 10%. Because Melchizedek had that direct access to God. That Abraham needed to go to him to attain it in that case. We don't have to do that. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 9 and 10... We're told, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Revelation chapter 1, 6 talks about us being a kingdom of of priests. Now God originally told Moses that when he established the kingdom of Israel, he was going to establish them as a kingdom of priests. And I'm not sure exactly how all of this worked out, but, but that was initially what was said. And then when the people we see saw the smoking mountain and they saw all of these things that terrified them, they said to Moses, no Moses, you go talk to God. Because if we go talk to God, we'll die. You go talk to God and you bring us back the word of God to us. And it was then, after that, that God set up for Moses the, pre the Aaronic priesthood. And this sacerdotal system, as it's called, that the people had to go through a priest to receive access to God Almighty. We don't have to do that. Talks about us as being a vine in some places a tree. And these ideas are very, very similar. This involves where we receive nourishment from. It also involves something we belong to. And it involves a certain amount of growth that is expected. When we plant a tree, I planted three peach trees in my front yard. And I fully expected after fertilizing and watering and taking care of those trees and working hard to keep them alive that they would begin to grow up and become larger and that they would begin to produce peaches. Now unfortunately this year they produced a good two dozen peaches and some critter got them right before they got ripe. <laughs> so I didn't get any peaches. But that wasn't the tree's fault. But I expected them to grow and prosper and bear fruit. And this is the idea of us as a vine or as a tree. Jesus said in John 15, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And for one of time, we won't continue to read through the rest of that. But read that for yourself when you go home tonight. Those eight verses. We're a part of Jesus Christ. We grow off of him. And as John chapter 1 and verse 1 says, He is the Word. So where is it we receive our nourishment from? We receive our nourishment from Jesus Christ Himself, who is this book. They are one and the same. And we are to grow in this Word, and we are to bear fruit in this Word for Jesus Christ. And I'll just say a quick word. I'm afraid too many times brethren want to bite, devour, and destroy one another instead of receiving nourishment from the Word and growing by it. We need to be careful about that. And then it talks about <clears throat> the people of God as being the bride of Jesus Christ. And in Ephesians chapter 5, we see the, uh, <clears throat> this idea being talked about very explicitly 
of the people of God being the bride of Christ. And he likens this in this passage to the husband and wife relationship. But he's not really talking about the physical husband and wife relationship here. He's talking about Christ and the church. And he says the church is to be a bride to Jesus Christ. Christ is to be the head of that bride. He gives himself for her and she gives herself to him. Just like a husband is to live for his wife and his wife is to live or give herself to her husband. You know the problem with too many marriages and I, I really... I blame the husbands most of the time. I don't know every case, and every case is different. But most of the time, just in my observation, the breakup of a marriage is usually primarily the husband's fault because he did not live for his wife. He did not become the kind of man that she would want to submit to. There's always exceptions to that rule. And if anybody's in that case, uh, I, I apologize. I'm not indicting you for that. Um, but, but that's what happens a lot of times. Um, if a husband will live for his wife, most of the time, she will want to give herself to him and submit to him. That's the way the church is to be toward Christ. Because he gave himself for us. He didn't just die for his bride. He lived for his bride a sinlessly perfect life before he died so that he could present her without spot or blemish to his father in heaven in Revelation chapter 21 we see this bride being adorned and coming down from heaven and I know many people who have lost <clears throat> their spouse saying you know I just I want to get to heaven so I can see him again and I do understand that sentiment because having lost my first wife, I would like to see her again in heaven. But you know what? There's something much more glorious involved in getting to heaven than seeing our loved ones who have gone on before us. In Revelation chapter 21, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying. And there shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. If you think that your marriage on this earth was a glorious, wonderful thing, and I hope that you do, Heaven is going to be so much more glorious and wonderful that that marriage on this earth is just going to pale by comparison. That's the kind of bride we should be preparing ourselves to be for Jesus Christ. In conclusion, as we've said, there are some eight terms or variants of these terms that each tell us something about the nature of God's people. If you will read the entire letter of Paul to the Ephesian church, you'll see that in this letter he uses each of these terms or a variant of these terms, an idea of these terms in that particular letter. And we oftentimes think of, oh, I've got to read a whole book of the Bible. Ephesians is a letter. It's not a book. You can read it in just a few minutes' time. But read it sometime looking for each of these ideas that we've talked about tonight. And it will teach you something about the nature of the people of God. I hope that this lesson has been of some benefit to someone here tonight. And I hope that you'll continue to think about these things, study them on your own, and...
And I failed to mention in a timely manner this morning, Gene Fielding, Jenna.